Well, I greatly delight in those reports mm -hmm. Amen. that we received tonight. So wasn't that wonderful? See, all of you are involved in those things, too, to some degree. Okay. This will be our 22nd lesson in Genesis. And tonight we're introduced to Sodom, but we won't stay there very long. There's a, quite a historical incident that happened here. I'm sure you've wondered for a long time who Chedor Laimer was. <laughs> we're going to find out tonight that he wasn't as significant as everyone thought he was. We'll be at Genesis 13. And uh, we're going to go through chapter 14, verse 17. It's kind of a lengthy passage, but... Now in this, God is setting the, setting the stage... For his redemptive work with Abraham, he's going he's gonna to show you how he was set in a circumstance that it doesn't look like anything good could come from this. And he's going to be separated from the, from the one person in the whole world that, that he was close to. But when it comes to the work of God... This separation is necessary. It wasn't necessary because Lot was bad because he was a righteous man. The scripture tells us he's a righteous man. So it wasn't, wasn't because of any iniquity in Lot. It's just that in the development of God's purpose, there isn't any place for flesh, fleshly relation or anything else. That's kind of hard, I know, to say that, but it's just too evident in Scripture. All these people up to Abraham, they had a lot of children. God only picked one of them for the lineage. Doesn't mean they were all lost. Now, at a point of our text, Lot and Sodom have they're separated. All right, this will begin chapter 13, verse 13. <clears throat> and the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. <laughs> How'd you like that to be said of your city? Uh, maybe it has been, I don't know. Huh? It's a whole city. Yeah. This is just what's said about it. The men of Sodom are wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said to Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward for all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth so that if a man can number the dust of the earth then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise. Walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it. I will give, for I will give it unto thee. 
Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in the which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. And it came to pass in the days of Aphrael, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, and Chedileomer, king of Elam, and that and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinar, 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 China, king of Adi, Adiah, and Shemember, king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. All these were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is the salt sea. I say, which is the salt sea. Twelve years they served, Chedorlaomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year came Chedorlaomer and the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephaims and Ashtaroth Karim, and the Zuzim in Flan, and the Flame, and the Emim, and Shavna Karitharim, and the Horites in their Mount Seir, unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and came to in, in Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazen Tamar. And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Edma, and the king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar. They were joined in battle with them in the valley of Siddim, with Chet Chedorlaomer, the king of Elam, and the title, the king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shanar, and Arioch, king of Eleazar, four kings with five. And the vale of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell, fell there. And they that remained fled to the mountains. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way and they took Lot, Abram's brother's son who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner, and these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken, <clears throat> he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Siddim, which is the king's dale. <laughs> mm. Well, those that love the word of God certainly don't lack for excitement. How do some people... That probably doesn't mean very much, that account, and a lot of people probably maybe don't even know what's in there. But it is. Now I want to underscore in this a divine manner. Holy Spirit inspired this. Remember, Moses wrote it down under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. 
God wanted people to know this, particularly his people. This is part of the word you live by every word of God. This is, this is part of it here. He executes his purpose under what seems impossible circumstances. All right, that's the thing that, uh, this is a pretty volatile, a volatile, volatile setting for a God to work out his eternal purpose, particularly when he's launching it <laughs> in the beginning stages. This is, uh, this is the kind of environment now Abram was in when this all started. Well, he saved Noah in the midst of adversity. That was, that was how he was saved. And Moses was born during a time the children were being slaughtered. I'm showing you this, this, this is how God works. So if things are looking pretty bad, look up. Amen. Must be something being worked out because this is the kind of circumstance God... Look at Israel the time Jesus was born. Look at the animosity of Herod at the time Jesus was born. Look how Saul of Tarsus got his start. You know, all you just go through Scripture and you find out this is how, this is God's manner because, see, in whatever God does, he's testifying of himself. His right arm, that's the working side. He does things so he can be better known. So he paints a bleak picture that looks like well, this is a terrible terrible time for Abraham to get his start all this and all this is happening right close to where he's living but this is God's manner he's going to show you who Daniel is by sticking him in the lion's den he, he's going to show you who Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are by sticking him in the furnace of fire he's going to take John the Baptist he's going to raise him up in the wilderness he's, this is God's God's way. He's going to begin the church when Israel's under Roman dominion. <laughs> See, this is, how God, this is how God works. He and God's kingdom, men are made strong out of weakness. Amen. Weakness is a circumstance out of which they come strong. <laughs> in fact, their strength is made perfect in weakness. The weaker they are, I dedicate this to prosperity preachers. I think they need to have something dedicated to them once in a while. So I'd like to dedicate this to them, that God never started anything with riches. Just in case anybody didn't know. Out of weakness, they're made strong. Those who ask, well, why the good people suffer? They don't understand this. This is how God works. <laughs> Even birth comes from pain. God gives a pretty vivid picture, doesn't it? In our text, the king rises to prominence, just runs rough shot over everybody. And he has a bunch of kings can, with him. They're dominating everything. But there's a man in the midst of this that's under the care of God. That we can throw a lot in here too. This is a big mistake, big mistake when they took a lot. It's a big mistake. <laughs> this is a big mistake. And when God corrects a situation, he doesn't need a lot of people. Lift up your eyes now. He doesn't need a lot of people. Behind the scenes here, Satan's working to draw Abram out of this whole thing. I don't question God has a he's doing something too, but God God in his when he works there's like a there's like a perimeter within which Satan can work that's inside what God's working. And it looks to Satan, he Satan can't learn anything, see. He can't be taught. See he'll never pick up on this because him and his hosts are Bound with chains of darkness, they're confined to a domain of ignorance, and they can't you can't get out of it. No matter no matter how many times Satan's defeated, he never learns anything from it. Amen. See? So it looks to Satan like, oh, this is I'm really going to be able to work here. I got I got a lot of kings down there that I've been working with, and 
I got a couple of cities that have dropped down in the bottom of the moral pit that I, I can do a lot here. And maybe in this circumstance, I get rid of Abram if I, I get, this is how Satan is thinking about this whole situation. You really, really want to see that. But those acquainted with divine manner know that God just, Satan, this is a crude way to say it, but Satan's on a leash. He can only go so far. The scripture says he's bound. Bound doesn't mean like tied up. He's restrained. He's, he's got to, he can go, he can only go within a certain radius. He doesn't know this. But behind the scenes, here's Satan trying to eliminate Abram after God's prospered him and trying to get rid of Lot. But God is working in all of this. Now, in the midst of all, before he begins this, he just throws this verse in. It looks, it looks like it doesn't have anything to do with anything, but Sodom's going to enter in this whole picture here. So he says, just by way of mentioning, by the way, the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. I said exceedingly. Well, by the way, and there have been in Sodom joining with us. They're going to try and do something. They're going to try and facilitate their will. It's going to look like they could do it. They're going to actually, king-wise, outnumber five to four. It makes a point. <laughs> makes a point that the five to four, and the five kings are kings of the five cities, four of which were destroyed with Sodom and Gomorrah. And Zoar was the fifth. The only reason it was spared was so Lot could get to it. Yeah, yeah. Those cities mm -hmm. yeah. are the ones that started this rebellion. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Men of Sodom were wicked and sinners. That is, they were unusually wicked. Well, some people say, well, all wickedness is the same. It's just a... Just as bad to overeat as it is to murder. People shouldn't talk like that because they could have kept secret how ignorant they were if they just would not say things. You can't be exceedingly wicked if all sin's the same. But there's some sin that goes beyond the normal boundaries. That's the kind of people Sodom was. Why, well, Jesus said to Judas, it would have been better if he'd never been born. Yeah, that's right. Now, if all sins are alike, when the disciples couldn't cast that demon out of that boy, and Jesus said, because of your unbelief, you couldn't do it, he didn't say, it had been better if you fellows hadn't have been born. Right. Yeah, yeah can't, that can't be said to every sinner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of, uh, the passages that speak of when God give men over to their own lusts, it's, it's like they're limited at a certain point, but when they go so far, it's like he lets them go to do whatever they want, and at that point, then they like do things that are far worse than anything That's they've right. ever done. Like it's a downhill thing. That's right. <clears throat> Jesus taught there's a sin that never has forgiveness. It, there is a sin that cannot be forgiven. Now, you've heard people say, any sin doesn't make a difference what it is. You could, well, you got to be more precise. You guys not talk so sloppily. You can't contradict the word of God when you talk. When you say any sin doesn't make a difference how bad it is, any sin can be forgiven. Jesus said, No, that's not so. There is a sin that cannot be forgiven. Thank God it's, you say sin. Thanks God, thank God it's not a lot of sin. So. And John said, there's a sin that's unto death. Nothing you can do about it. Prayers can't change it. The person sins and dies as a result. Judas died because he sinned. Hmm? There's sins like that. Can't be reversed. He said, I don't say, I'm not even telling you to pray for a sin that's unto death. There's, there's nothing can be done about that. But then he adds, all sins aren't unto death. There is a sin that's not unto death. Now that's the one. See, well, how do we know the difference? Well, you got to walk in the light, and then 
I can tell you'll never be satisfied with your level of understanding on this, but if you walk in the light, it'll make it a little better. And Jesus spoke to Pilate about a greater sin, that he that those that committed me to you, they are guilty of the greater. Sin. And David talked about the great transgression. He asked the Lord to be with him so he wouldn't commit the great transgression. People know about this for some time. Holy people. It's good to ask that to the Lord. Lord, don't let me commit the great transgression. Say, what is it? I'm not even interested in knowing what it is. I, want, I don't want to commit it. That's the point. And God doesn't even the sin that has never forgiveness, it's so stated that people are trying to figure out what it is. You know, they can't. Some people say, well, this is what it is. It's rejecting Jesus. How about for stupidity, that kind of takes the, that takes the trophy home there. Because all of us rejected Jesus at some time. So know that, that Jesus said, all men are blessed and he will be forgiven to men. Blaspheme against the Father, blaspheme against the Son. Not blasphemy against the spirit. That will not be forgiven. What is it? I don't know what it is. You, you don't either. <laughs> and people say they know they don't either. That's not why this was, it wasn't given to define it. It was given to warn people, don't let sin take hold of your life. Amen. The smallest sin could end up like this if it's not checked. So all sin is not of the same weight. Although it is of the same nature. <clears throat> so the Spirit states that men of Sodom were wicked and exceeding great sinners. That's how the Amplified puts it before the Lord. The word sinners is then enhanced. <laughs> Ordinarily sinners, that, that covers the whole gamut. But then there's a level at which the you can enhance the word sin. It's exceeding great. So this is not just a class of men or a kind of sinners that there are. This this is a this category of sin, not not a category of sinners. And the Sodom had committed this sin. And if you're familiar with scripture, you'll know that in Romans, the first chapter. Sodomy that is being popularized yeah. is declared to be the result of divine abandonment. Yeah. Amen. You can argue all you want. That's what the text says. He gave them over. And that's why they dropped into that pit. I know it's kind of a frightening thought. And it ought to be. People are saying, that we're against sodomy, but we, we love the sodomites. I don't love the sodomites. I'll be right up front with you. I don't love them at all. Why? Because the sin is so reprehensible. You to commit it, God has to let go of you. To commit it. So can they recover? That's up to God. Some apparently have. That's up to God. But this is this helps to arm people. Yeah. If if there's young people or anything like that that are tempted in that direction, this is Amen. just remind them of this. Yeah. Don't get into that. Yeah. Whatever you do. So this sentence introduces and prepares us for the revelation about Sodom later. But here now he leaves having said <laughs> Having said this, God, his nature doesn't allow him just like to dwell, just to dwell on commenting about iniquities. He can only do it so long and get back to the people he's working with. So he turns his attention right away. Because if he knew if he thought on this long enough, he'd, just, he'd destroy him prematurely. He's got to get his, get his mind off that. So he turns us back. The Lord said to Abram. After Lot separated from him. Notice how, say, how precise it is. The Lord said unto Abram after that Lot had separated from him. 
And it wasn't because of any difference between Abram and Lot. They didn't. They didn't have any differences. It was their herdmen because, and it was, wasn't griping around but one another. It was because there wasn't enough food to sustain both of their flocks. So they had to haggle about it. However, this relationship that Abram had been called into, the thing God had, been, had called him into, couldn't maintain that kind of association. He wasn't condemning Lot because he calls him a righteous man later. But when you got Lot, you had everything that was with Lot. <laughs> Sometimes people learn this. They bury somebody and then, oh, they found out they got a lot of other folk went along with it. You know, <laughs> that they never experienced before they got. <laughs> think about young people. When you think you're picking out someone you want to marry, when they, just be careful. Let's just say it that way. Just be careful. Always marry someone who's a, in Christ because there's a sin not to. Not be not unequally yoked together. Because they all cut the whole parcel comes along. So now that God's gonna, He's gonna from this point on in the book. Everything's going to be about Abraham and his seed from this point to the end of Revelation. Everything's about Abraham and his seed. So this separation had to take place because for concentration. There came a time Moses, he'd been 40 years in Egypt, but he, he had to leave Egypt. Joseph, he had to, at a young age, he had to leave his family. So yeah, but he was sold. Yeah, but God was over this. God sent him Amen. when he was 17. God sent him to Egypt. That's what Psalm 105 says. Why? Because well, the time was coming. He's going to enter into his ministry. So he had to be. He had to be out of the house to do it. It didn't condemn the rest of the house. I'm just telling you what there's works God has for His people to do. That it, listen, if you want to be employed by God. And you really do. You really want to serve him now. You really want to do this. There may come a time when you have to, like, leave the house yeah. without condemning the house. And Elisha, he had to leave his occupation. He's a plowing a 12 yoke of oxen, but when the time came, he had to, he had to leave it. Samuel had to leave home when he was just a boy, Amos had to leave his occupation. John the Baptist had to leave his family and live in the wilderness. Peter and Andrew, James and John, they had to leave their family business. Matthew had to leave his job. You don't do this on your own. It's not like this is a law you got to do. It's not, that's not the way it is. If you want to be used by God now, that's really what you want. God's a hiring laborers. Yeah, that's right. Amen. He is. Yeah. But now when you work in his vineyard, it's all, he only has room for full-time servants. Yeah. So every person has a work. That uh, to work out himself, he's got to work out his salvation, fear and trembling, keeping what his position in the kingdom of God is. Paul said to Timothy, "Be endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Yeah, I said, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who had chosen to be a good soldier. See, there's, Amen. they just had a men's meeting in our fair area. Or are going to have it. I forget which it is. I just got the announcement. The subject is going to be, can we re do we really have to do without the enjoyable things of life? Whatever that means. So I know the man very well. I would say to him, well, that all depends on what you've been called to do. 
If you've been called to some significant work in the kingdom, yeah, there's some things you can't do that everybody else can do. Everybody else may be able to plow and fish, but some people can't. So a lot separated from him. Remember one time Paul said, I become all things to all men that I may, by all means I may save some. And some say, that's why I have tattoos. I wear tattoos to people who have tattoos to be attracted. Paul's not, that's not what Paul's talking about. What Paul is talking about is when he considered a person weak in the faith, didn't have a lot of understanding, he curtailed the things he did not to leave that person the idea that it was all right to be that kind of person. He wasn't speaking of close friendships. That isn't what he was talking about. He's talking about this person over here doesn't think he can eat meat. I don't sit down at his house and order a steak. <laughs> Principles lived out in our text. Lot separates. God makes a point of noting it was in order that God might move ahead with Abram. Go ahead. Interesting to see how that for Abraham, when he got big enough, yeah. when he got at the right size, uh, and that was known because that particular area could support both flocks, yeah. then God uh, was able, to, now the story will begin to focus on, right. on Abraham, Abraham. See, and then, uh, but yeah, I can see the similarity. Yeah. You know, it's like in the fullness of time, right. now Abraham has reached this point where God will begin to focus on him more. That's right. And, uh, you gotta show and, him and he's, called to the, he's been called to That's work right. now. You've got to show him things he didn't show Lot. Mm -hmm. It isn't because Lot was wicked. It's because Lot was, didn't occupy the position in God's plan that Abraham occupied. That, that's the point. We're not talking about personalities. That's not what we're talking about here. All right, now, after he separated, God said, Lift up now thy eyes and look from the place where thou art. Look from there now. Abram had to view now the land from where he was. From the place, from the place thou art, which was a high place. It was between Bethel and Ai, which was identified as a mountain. He went back to that place of the altar, which was on a high place, a mountain. And God says, now from this high place where you are, now from the place you are, don't go any place else yet. I'm going, to have you, I'm going to have you walk through the land, but when you're looking at the land, you've got to get up high. Amen. Amen. Place where he was was referred to as the place of the altar and a mountain. Of course, when God showed Moses the land, he showed him the land from a mountain, too. Remember, he took Mount Nebo, showed him the land from a mountain. Now, there are several ways we can look at the provisions of salvation. There are lower areas where not much can be seen. Well, all I know is that the Lord loves me and Christ died for me, and that... Well, that's a low view. See, that's a low view. It's genuine. I mean, what you see at the low view is real. It's not that it's not real. It's just, it's just like it doesn't have that big of an impact upon the people. There are people that they can, uh, they have a, how can I obtain a lot of this world view? So they're looking, I want to know what I can do to get a lot. I just had a rather lengthy discussion with a man from Owasa, Owasso, and he said, I've been serving God, how come I'm not rich? That was his opening shot. As I said, well, where'd you get the idea you should be rich? Well, I've been serving the Lord, and this week came and I didn't have enough again. Why, why is this so? Because, well, God didn't promise you riches. I can't answer your question. I don't know why. He said, well, you're rich, aren't you? I said, no, no, I'm not rich. 
I live, actually do live day to day. It took him quite a while. He finally just kind of gave up, but he, he'd been taught this. He'd been taught this. He had that kind of view. He's looking down here, Lord, how much of this, what do I have to do to have a lot? Well, if you send this ministry a lot of money, you'll get a lot of money. See, there are people tell them that. Oh yeah. oh, yeah, they'll tell them that. You sow into this ministry, seed faith, and you'll get rich. But you got to, it's going to be in the denomination you're sowing. If you sow hundreds, you get hundreds. Sow thousands, you get thousands. This is taught, though. I'm not making this up. You sow millions, you get millions. Is that view of the kingdom? That's a low, very low view, yes. That we are debtors. Debtors. Amen. <laughs> We're the ones that owe. Amen. Amen. There's uh what's the minimal requirements view? Is that view? What do I really have to do? I want to know what I what really has to be done. I I, the extra stuff, I'm not interested in this, but just what, what's the, the least I can do? That's too low of a view. That might be called a religious interest view. But they're all lowland views. God told Abraham from this high place, look at the land from up here. That's how you've got to look at salvation. You've got to look at it from a high, high view. I gave you some things there to you can see like the propitiation for sin. Mm -hmm. Sin as we recover, justification and salvation from wrath and the, the power of God and the severing your association with the world and redemption and forgiveness and being brought near to God, having the enmity, the thing that's against God, slain. <laughs> And the obedience of Christ participating in it, having peace made, and oh, it's a whole host of things. You, salvation is a marvelous spectrum, but it can only be seen from a high place. Baby Christians can't see it. Uh -huh. right. yeah. We should proclaim it, but listen, if a person is at a young, young age in Christ, they can't see this. They got to grow or to get up on the mountain. They have to get on the mountain to see it. Well, you, you proclaim it anyway. Because in the kingdom of God, you only get what you can see. That's what you get. You, when you can see that God forgives sin, then you, then you can get it. You can get up so high that you can't even notice the people down there. Yeah, amen. <laughs> They're there, but... Yeah, God says, get up here now. I want you to look at, look at the country from where you are. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it. Never bit of it. Abraham and his descendants will be given all he could see. Isn't that a great principle? Yeah. Great thing. I've given it to you forever. Now forever did mean to Abraham the same thing it does to you. God hadn't even revealed the concept of forever or eternal at the time of Abraham. This, this hadn't been revealed, brethren. So in those days, he'd say forever. What he meant was it's not going to end. As long as you're alive, you'll have this. That's what he was, that's how they thought about it. You, now you've been given to think, you're from a higher mountain. You can see that this stretches into the world to come. They didn't know anything about the world to come. Now, they didn't have an intelligent view of it because it hadn't been revealed. So when he said, I'll give it to you forever, it meant this is not going to be interrupted. It's not going to be a temporary arrangement. I'm going to transfer the title to you. Now, faith's got to be able to see this. Now, he said something like this to Noah also. Here's how he said it to Noah. I remember said that forever meant, as so far as you're concerned, this, this isn't going to end in this world. To Noah, he, to Noah, he said, while the earth remaineth, see, 
Seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. That's why all the earth remains. That's, that's as big as forever was to these patriarchs of old. They looked for a city that had foundations whose builder and maker is God, but their, their understanding kind of faded out. It just wasn't made known what it was. So by faith, when he was tried, Abraham offered Isaac, thinking of this, Abraham and his seed, through your seed, I'm going to do this. He's, he's thinking about that promise. So this can't be interrupted by Isaac being slain, so I'll offer Isaac, because I'm convinced it can't interrupt what, what God is doing. It's how faith reacts to the promises of God. I'll make thy seed as the dust of the earth. <laughs> so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then, then shall thy seed also be numbered. That's, that's before he's had any children now. Why did he say that? This is, he had to give Abraham some something of faith to take hold of. Border of the land. That's right. You're right. Hey, Abraham, he couldn't see the border of the land. That's right. And that's the way the promises of God are. He talks about extending his kindness to us in the world to come or following Amen. the Lamb, whether so he goes, or sitting in in his throne as he that's sat right. with his father. But you never seem to get to the end of that. That's right. Which, which fuels anticipation. That's Amen. right. Amen. Well said. Yeah, it gets right down to it. You really can't see beyond today. He really gets down to it. <laughs> you got to live for the moment, knowing the promises of God are s stable. Amen. That's the thing that he's making known to, to Abraham. Now, God made said this several times. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make your seed multitudinous. I'm going to a lot, a lot. Genesis 12, 2, he made mention of this. I will make of thee a great nation. All right, that was kind of a beginning. Genesis 13, 18, now make thy seed as the dust of the earth. Genesis 16, 10, the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered by multitude. Genesis 22, 17, and blessing thou bless thee, multiply thou multiply thee, thy seed as the stars of heaven. Now God made the same promise to Jacob, said the same thing. Thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and in each of thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. See, now this promise was generally known to, to all of Abraham's offspring. They just, they passed this. This is the difference between the Jew and the Gentile. This is the difference. They passed it down. They, I said they passed it down. See, this is something the Gentile church has, it has done miserably in passing down. Yeah, right. It has done miserably. Mm -hmm. But even though the Jews were hard, stiff-necked and hard-hearted and rebelled, it's, they passed it down. They did something the Gentiles to this living day have never learned. Uh -huh. Passed it down. Amen. What was said. He's written in Romans 4. Paul brought this up. As it is, it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before whom thou hast believed, and so forth. Hebrews mentions it. By faith, Abram, when he was called to go to a place which he should after receive or inherit his obey, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promises in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac, the heirs of the same promise. See? And again in Hebrews eleven seventeen, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, Then Isaac shall I see be called, accounting that God is able to raise him from the dead. See, so he's he's banking on this. Amen. All through his life, he's banking on this promise. I'll make your seed multitudinous. Just like the seed of heaven. This promise was, as I said, was generally noted among the Israelites. When Moses pled for Israel at Mount Sinai after they made that golden calf, 
He brought this promise up. He reasoned with God. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest I by thy own self, and says, Unto thee I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. He brought it up. He knew about it. The prophets knew about it. Hosea, that's one of the later prophets. Here's what he said. Hosea 1. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the dust to the, as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured and numbered, and it shall come to pass in the place where it was said unto them, Ye shall not be my people there. They shall, ye said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Then shall the children of Jacob and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head. They shall come out of the land, for great shall be the city of Jezreel. It's a banking on that, the prophets. Multitude in the seed. Now at this point, this did include some other nations. Fleshly nations that sprang from Abraham. The, I've did considerable research on this, and I finally found out that nobody knows. All the nations that came from Abraham. I wanted to be sure now that I had exhausted all the resources. Nobody knew. That's how many of the ark. Nobody knew. That's what he said. No man can number. That's right. That's what he, that's what he, that's what he said. Amen. So the fleshly nations that descended from Abraham came through Ishmael, Isaac, Zimran, Jokshan, Median, Medan, Midian, Ishbek, and Shua. That's his eight sons. Nations came from Ishmael alone. Twelve nations came from him. Just, 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 just mill on. Many nations came from all those. So I've concluded they're just so multitudinous. You may, I could waste a lot of time doing this research. I wanted to make sure I had done my homework, you know, on this. But I, there, this wall was there no matter who, <laughs> who I read after, who the expert was, how long he'd been in it and all of that. They all finally had to admit, we don't know. But God did. Amen. And this doesn't reckon, I haven't even mentioned the spiritual seed that's come from Abraham. Because he's the father of all who walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham. And those who are, believe are of the faith of Abraham. Know therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. See, this is a this is a, another generation. It's separate from from all the other generations. And it's it's the biggest one. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is the biggest branch of Abraham's seed. So I want you to look at the land now. Look at it with with your seed in mind, and I'm going to multiply. Then he tells Abraham, you've looked at it. Now I'll walk through it. Arise, walk through the land and the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Just how you've seen it. Now that you've seen it, I want you to take a personal survey of it. Walk, walk through the land. Other versions read, come. Go through the land from one end to the other. Walk through it. Take you a while. Living Bible says, hike in all directions and explore the new positions. <laughs> you, you must see where I'm going. <laughs> where I'm going with this. This is great. When Lot and Abram were together and they looked at the land, what did they see? The part that had pasture. Mm -hmm. yeah. huh? <laughs> That's all they saw. Because that's all they were looking for. That's all they were looking for. Yeah. Pasture. And now Abram, now he's looking, not, he's not looking with cattle in mind. He's looking with an innumerable seed Amen. in mind. This is going to change how Abraham looks at the land. Now, there's a principle to be seen here. God insists that we see or know what he has given to us. This is the ultimate reason for edification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Because God only gives you what you can see or what you can understand. For instance, until you understand that out of weakness you're made strong, you'll find yourself stumbling a lot. This is what happens. Someone could get on your case and say, stop that stumbling. You're all the time stumbling. Make straight paths for your feet. Well, that's all true, but either you, he that walks in the light doesn't stumble, yeah, yeah. Jesus said. Yeah, so if you can see properly, you won't stumble. God insists on this now. You remember the spies went out to examine the, they, to examine the land. They were to walk through the land. In Numbers, the first time they come up to the border of the land, they, they walk through the land. Like Abraham did. They were able to do it. See the, see the land now. I give you houses to live in you didn't build. Now there's, there's olive yards you didn't plant you're going to have. There's grape yards you didn't plant. I'm going to say, well, I want you to see all the brooks and all the valleys, all the rich resources. Walk through the land and see that. They walked through the land, but and they saw that. But that wasn't all they saw. They told Moses and Aaron, We came into the land which thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. This is it's everything you said. But <clears throat> nevertheless the people be strong that dwell in the land. Oh boy, look how big those people are. They're giant people. They got look. Oh, they got walls around their cities. We, we never confronted walls like that before. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. The Canaanites be in the land. A bunch of giants. That's that's what they saw. That's what they saw. And uh, so God said, "You can't have it. Can't see it." They don't get it. It's marvelous to see that. Amen. Amen. Instead of recalling that, here's what they see. Here's, here's their words. Nevertheless, the people would be strong, dwell in the land. The cities are walled, very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Enoch there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. That's what we saw. <laughs> It neutralized everything else we saw. Joshua and Caleb, they saw the same thing, right? They were with them. They said, we're well able to go up and take the country. Yeah, that's what they saw. They saw the rich resources that were there. Yeah. Um, I was considering that since Joshua and Caleb were walking in the light of the Lord, they were able to see more. The light was, since they were in the light, they were able to see more. The light shed more. That's right. Yeah, that's right. All right, see, then, I'm going to read the scripture. Sin not. The phrase is made several times in scripture. The phrase is there. Sin not. I write these things unto you that you sin not. Some people look at this and they say, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not going to be able to do that. Other people look at it. They say, they see what you're going to, by not sinning, what you come into the possessions you come into because of that. They, they, that's what they see. That's what God expects of his people. See, don't look at the prohibitions. Look at what God's promised. And that makes the, proposi the prohibitions doable. See, God will not intolerate a people who refuse to appropriate what he's provided. Now, this changes how you view religious people, changes how you view religion. Because there's all kind of people, they want to be Christians, they want to be saved, they want to have their sins forgiven. When they die, they want to go to heaven. But not bad enough to be holy. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't have this without... But to help a person to fulfill all these sin knots and be not and so forth, 
he gives you to see what's what you've got in Christ. And when you see it, this other looks pretty small. Amen. Pretty small. One of the great sins of the modern church is that of not appropriating what God has provided. All kinds of people say, I just, I can't forgive myself. Yeah. What do you do? Well, we've got a, a staff of psychiatrists at our church. Now, it'll cost you $100 an hour, yeah. but uh, we have a counseling mm -hmm. help you with that problem, not being able to forgive yourself. Let me tell you something. When you see that God has forgiven your sins, yeah. you don't have any trouble with self-condemnation. Yeah, right. But you have to walk through the land. Yeah. You've, got to, you've got to see it. Uh, to encourage uh, <laughs> people to move and when they come into the kingdom to start moving. Mm -hmm. That's right. So they, can, they can see. Walk through the land. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now if you take the words like understanding, discernment, comprehension, perception, knowing, I give you text here, the scriptures filled. What, what are all those words? Understanding, discerning, comprehending, perceiving, knowing is walking through the land. That's what it is. You'll find out that there's, uh, there's protection, there's privilege. It's all there in the salvation. Of course, all of this presumes that you know what God has provided. Salvation is itself calculated to provide everything that's necessary to maintain it. Staying saved, that's a bad expression, but s s remaining where God puts you, uh -huh. that's the hard part. <laughs> right. If you think difficult, if you think it was difficult to get in, could it be as difficult as a camel going through the eye of a needle? If you think it's difficult to get in, yeah. wait till you see what's required to stay in. Yeah. You get in and it's over. But to stay in, lifetime. Yeah. It doesn't take you a lifetime to be born again. Yeah, that's right. But it does to perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. So the responsibility of walking through the land is there to see the riches of his glory and the greatness of his power and things freely given to you of God and the love of God that passes all knowledge and that you have eternal life and that all things are yours, including Paul and Apollos and Cephas. That we have boldness and access with confidence to God. That nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. That we have peace with God. That we have a building of God eternal in the heavens waiting for us. We have redemption through his blood. We've obtained like precious faith. What is that? That's walking through the land. Until you see what God's given to you, you'll not be able to enjoy his benefits. So Abram, walk to the land. I will give it to you. And what, what is in and what is in that which God gives when it's seen will sustain you to remain in the land. Once you walk to the land, you'll not move again to Egypt. <laughs> So understanding God's eternal purpose, this is woven throughout, throughout Scripture, that you've got, as you grow, you can see the land's bigger than you thought. See? Now, if you're thinking of salvation the same way you thought of it when you came in, you've got to stretch your mind. You've got to walk through the land. You've got to see how much is in salvation. It's not enough to that your sins can be forgiven. That's not enough to sustain. You gotta have, we gotta, you're saved by hope. See, walk through the land. Now these are the things that will stay perfectly proportionate with one another. This little graphic here, is, it's like a sliding scale. These three things stay together, knowledge, 
confidence mm -hmm. and assurance. Yeah, right. You always stay at the mm -hmm. same level. You can't know a little and have a lot of confidence. Right. It, it, it doesn't work that way. Amen. You can't know a lot and not have assurance. They all, yeah. they all are linked That's right. together. They all require walking through the land, knowing what you've got. Mm -hmm. As you think upon it, assurance mm -hmm. is birthed. And confidence comes into the picture. But when you remain ignorant, all of those are at a low level. So after this, Abram moved his tent. <clears throat> He's up on a mountain now. But now he can't stay up there. He's got to walk to the land. So he doesn't locate up a mountain, so he has to walk down the mountain and walk up the mountain. He moves down into the area he's going to survey. He dwelt in the plain, not a mountain, the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron. And now he, he built an altar on the mountain, you remember? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so now he's on the he builds an altar down there. Wherever you are, you got to build an altar. Yeah. Amen. you got to have some thanksgiving to God, reliance upon God has to be located where you're at. Where you're at. Remember, this was the place, that altar was the place where Abram first moved after he got the promise from God. Now, the believer must so order his life as to make it convenient to peruse the things of God. All right, now, this gets kind of personal, but I don't, I can't apply any of this. But you've got to apply it. You can, you can structure your life so you don't have a lot of time left for God. Yeah. It's possible to do this. I, it's, I, got, I got my own work for my life, so I'm not going to get involved in anybody else's life for this. But you have to get involved in it. There's some things as you grow that you'll find you're not able to do. Not because they're sinful, but because they sap your strength and your time. Well, there's some things I don't do now that I didn't think I'd ever be able not to do. I just thought it's, I enjoyed them. They weren't they were weren't sinful things. But then I found that well, after a while, I couldn't I. I couldn't do them because there's too big a penalty to pay. I, now this is this every believer has to cross this bridge. You may have associations, you may have things you like to do, you may have hobbies, there's all kind of distractions that you may be able to do them all your life. And then again, you may not. That's right. <laughs> but if you build an altar, it'll help you make the decision. Yeah. It'll help you work that out, maintain your association with, with the Lord. And I did want to say a, a word about what I call the art of dedication. At this point, you already should be picking up on this, that Abraham's total life is lived for God. You don't find him getting involved in anything else but what pertains to God. You start, uh, search the record now, up, up to date. This is, this is what's happened. The art of dedication. Now, I know, I wish I could correct this, but I, it, this is not something that one person can correct for another that there are some people that they've never got to that point to where they're fully dedicated to God. They just, I put, suppose there's a time when other people saw I hadn't seen it either, but now I know that was a burden to them when they saw it. You, you can't just go out and correct it. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not that kind of thing, but it grieves you because you know. Oh, that person, they could have seen this, the thing they're having trouble seeing. They could have seen it if they wouldn't have just had all these other things. Just not sinful things, just things that are just bleeding their energies away. And if you're a laborer in the kingdom, then it's kind of special rules apply to you. The art of dedication. Abraham had to choose to stay in Canaan. This was his land. God didn't intend for him to own Canaan, but live in Ur. <laughs> no, he had to live there. 
God knew how to get Abram to live here. I got to get him to walk through the land to That's see right. to see what's here. Then it, and he'll find out it's it's worth it to live here. Abraham's calling impacted his entire life. You see that when God called him, he just he'd get up and move every time. Now at this point, we're introduced. Now he just it looks like we're leaving Abraham altogether. Abram altogether. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, of the king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Eliezer, Chedor, Laomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of the nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemember, king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. All these were joined together in the Vale of Siddim, which is the this, uh, this Salt Sea which worldly historians call it the Dead Sea. It was a valley at this time. It was a valley. <laughs> but it's going to be turned into a Dead Sea later on. Now the territory covered by these are the ones mentioned in the 10th chapter of Genesis when there was an account of the distribution of the people. Remember, they, God divided the people. And the border of of the Canaanites was from Sidon as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboam, even unto Lacia, which was, was, was Zor, the same cities mentioned back in Genesis 10. These are the same cities that are going to be cursed by God. Fire and brimstone is going to fall on them. And Moses is going to remind them in Deuteronomy of these these cities. The only one spared was Zoar, which was a little one. And uh, it was for Lot's sake that he was spared. Now it says they gathered the Siddim Valley, which is which is the Salt Sea. I did want to say a word about the Salt Sea. There's a little map of it there. Dead Sea. You see the Jordan River flows southerly through the land and it empties into the Dead Sea. Up the other way, it goes into the Sea of Galilee, which had an outlet. But the Salt Sea didn't have an outlet. It's receiving, 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 receiving. But the only way the water got out of there was by evaporation which left salt crystals and became a salt sea. And a tremendous lesson to see here. If you think that you can receive from God, receive from God, receive from God, receive from God, but you never output anything, you're dead wrong. That's right. You will stagnate. You will stagnate. What you have will get salty and no one will be able to handle it. In fact, they used to call old timers that are set in their ways the old salt. <laughs> like a salt sea. Well, what are you like? Are you like a sea of Galilee? Or are you like a dead sea? The difference between the two is the outlet. Yes, <laughs> what is the body of Christ is the established and official outlet unrestricted outlet. So in the body of Christ, anything you've been given to see from God, you can you can't do it in the world. You can you can share some things, but you can't you can't uh, everything you can't cast pearls to swine, see? So this explains why some people are in the, in the state they're in. Brother Matthew. Yeah, um, uh, the, the, talking about people receiving, receiving and not having no outlet. It's more serious than people uh, take it because the things of God, when you receive them, it, it, it naturally uh, it gives you this inclination to want to say something about it. So like yeah. It does a work within yeah. you. So for that not to happen, you almost have to have to squash it, you know? You almost have to have yourself involved in things that prevent that from happening. So yeah. it's, it's more serious than... Yeah, amen. You can see it, can't you? Oh, this whole thing now is structured. Even the physical layout of the land is structured according to what God's doing. 
everything headed in this direction. Now he mentions the reign of Chedro Laomer. Twelve years he dominated these other kings for twelve years they served Chedro Laomer. That in scripture generally means they paid taxes. That's, that's what it took tribute of them. When a nation would conquer another nation, that nation had to pay tribute to them. That's what Israel was doing with Rome. They're paying tribute. Remember, they asked, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar? See, it was a foreign country, but they're paying tribute to it because they've been conquered by it. But in the 13th year, the 13th year, the kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, and Zoar, they rebelled. We're not going to pay the taxes anymore. Now the stage is getting set for the involvement of Abram. <laughs> See? Because Abram now, he's going, to give, he's going to be required to do something that will exceed his ability. We're talking about Cheddar Lamer. We're not, we're not talking about some head of a small country down the road. Okay. We're talking about Chedor Lamer that for 12 years dominated. 13th year they rebelled. The 14th year came Chedor Lamer and the kings were with him and smote the Rephraims, Ashtoreth, Kuranaim, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Emims in Sheva. Cariathium and the Horites in their Mount Seir and El Perrin, which is by the wilderness. <laughs> it even took on the Amalekites and the Amorites. I'm showing the power of this. Yeah. He swept through that region and he just devastated it. I gave you a little background to some of those nations if you're interested in it. Now, why is this why is this mentioned? Why why bring this up? Well, now this again, this is a principle God operates by. A little less than 500 years after this, Israel's going to come in the land. These nations are still going to be in there. They're going to be commissioned to drive them out. But 500 years earlier, they're down there. And so God's going to weaken them. So when Israel comes, they can handle them. That's what's happening here. Otherwise, they would have grown uncontrollable, just like the world in Noah's days. He had just kept on getting worse, worse. So he raises up Cheddar Lamar to go down and to keep these nations, reduce the number and the power and influence of them. So when Israel gets down there, they'll be able to take the land. <laughs> I, won't, I won't say that, but that's a great thing. Great thing to see. And it's the same has happened to you, too, in some way, that before you got where you're at, God neutralized the powers that would keep you from going where you've gone. Amen. Yes. In the same train of thought, we can think the opposite way that before we get there, the Lord has already made provision for us for when we will arrive. That's He's right. Considering the same thing, whenever uh, Joseph went down into Egypt, yeah. the Lord sent him there and made Amen. Him to preserve <laughs> the life of his chosen people. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, shows us the advantage of looking forward and looking backwards. That's good. Hope, hope can see forward. Yeah. But looking backward, you you can see more of the details and more more of the wisdom and the, make make connections with things that you couldn't see at the time. Amen. And you can't see now. Yeah, I've shared with you some of my own experiences, but you probably have some that if you look back over your life, you'll find there were some lifelong associations that you had that for some reason they were terminated. But you've got to see it as if it wasn't because of some kind of blunder or stubbornness or this sort of thing, is God making a way for you to inherit the things. Now, numerically speaking, there's five kings against four. He makes a, he makes a point of it. Four kings with five, and the veil of Siddim was full of slime pits. Use that slime was kind of a sticky substance they used for mortar, you remember, in Genesis 11. Now, what this is going to take, these, these five, the five kings, those are the ones that are rebelling. Five kings against four kings. 
But now Solomon said this once, it's going to be demonstrated here. Though hand joined in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished, and the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. So even if wicked people combine their forces, God's will is still going to be done. The kings of Sodom and Gomorrah during this skirmish. The king, see, I keep bringing up this Sodom and Gomorrah. It keeps popping up. The kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. They, they, they got out of there. It got too heavy for them. And they fell in these slime pits. There says there were a lot of slime pits. They fell in them. Was it by accident? Well, some feel they did. But I kind of side to the people to think they, they jumped in them as they took their own lives, like falling on the sword. It was like that kind of thing to get out of there. So they, now they had rebelled, but see, their rebellion went, went sour. <laughs> and their efforts went awry, and they said, we're getting out of here. God caused that now. Yeah. The wicked can unite and rebel only to a certain point. Sodom, the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly, which means even after this resounding defeat didn't change That's right. Sodom. Way at the beginning, he said they were wicked and sinners exceedingly before the Lord. Cheddar Lamer comes down, he gives them a good whipping, good chastening, mm -hmm. defeats them thoroughly. Didn't change them, they still same way. That's right. Kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, they, they fell. And the invading armies under Chedorlaomer and more took everything, sacked the cities, took all the goods, all the possessions, all the food, victuals, all the food. And now, big mistake, they took Lot and all his goods, too. Now, this involved herds of cattle and all kind of thing that the defeating army had to take along, along with them. Now, this incident is mentioned only as a context for considering Abram. That's the only reason it's brought up is because Abram's going to get involved in this. If he wasn't, this, this would have been left out of the record altogether. But now Abram's going to get involved. They took a lot in his goods, and someone from Sodom escaped. Like, remember Lot, when they Lot lost all he had, a servant escaped each time. Someone escaped and came to Abraham, Abram. Now here it is, first time this word's in the Bible. Abram the Hebrew. All right, there's the first time that word's in the Bible, right there. Abram the Hebrew. He already was distinct. For he dwelt in the plain of Mamre. Now there's another reason why I come down off the mountain. He's accessible to, for this report. No one had to hunt or climb the mountain. He was right down there where he could receive this report. Told Abram the Hebrew. And he mentions that there were some people, they were confederate with Abram. Heathen in the promised land were confederate with Abram. That is, they were colleagues. They agreed among themselves, probably to protect one another, and this, that's probably the kind of thing it was. Confederate with Abram. The names of Eshcol and and here, when applied to people, are only mentioned two times in Scripture. And it's in regard to this incident. The only reason they're mentioned is because they were confederate with Abram. That's the only reason they're even mentioned. The word translated confederate means covenant or alliance. All right, now, later, under the law, God forbade his people to make an alliance like this. Later, here's what he said. Deuteronomy 7, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them, Thou shalt make no covenant with them, and shall nor show mercy on them, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, and his 
daughter shalt thou not take unto thy son. No covenant. So someone says, there you are, Abram did the wrong thing. No, Abram didn't do the wrong thing. Because that rule there was after the heathen had been cast out. After you've cast him out then. So Abram didn't, he didn't break this rule by making his covenant. And they were, they were confederate with Abram. Abram wasn't confederate with them. <laughs> That's a different. So what did Abram do? Abram doesn't say, well, what do you expect me to do? I mean, four kings, Cheddar, Lamb, or let's not forget he ruled for 12 years. Let's not be forgetting that. And then he swept through it a whole Amalekites and Amorites and all these other rites. He, let's not forget who we're talking about here. I'm sorry to hear that they took a lot captive, but I mean, I'm only a man. That's not what he did. When Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants born in his own house, 318. That probably is a kind of small next to <laughs> the armies of four kings and their armies. Four kings, four nations and their armies that ran roughshod over the entire south southwestern region of Canaan. 318 men. Now he refers to him as Lot as his brother. Yes? Before you move on, something that I was considering was um, Abraham knew um, that he was on God's side. He knew that the Lord would protect him. He had yeah. confidence in God and not in the yeah. world. That's not right. Earthly men. That's right. See, his fellow, his previous mm -hmm. fellowship with God now it paid mm -hmm. dividends at this right. time. See, yeah, That's right. Good point. I said, well, why does he say brothers? Some make a big deal out of this, boy, they say, well, it means kinsmen, and some versions say nephew, and some say lot. And listen, under the Jewish economy, brother, it meant something else under the Jewish economy. The Jews were told to, they're, they're, all, the, all the Jews were called their brethren, no matter who they were. So they use the word brother, not always it's a blood, immediate family type situation. All right, so it takes his uh, 318 trained. <laughs> These are trained servants. He had a lot more servants. Some people, people estimate he must have, if, he, if the trained servants are 318, he must have had in the thousands of servants taking care of all his herds and so forth. So we're talking about 318 like the Green Berets. <laughs> he armed them. He trained them. And I gather that we're to, he trained them not to pick corn, but to fight. Trained them how to do it. And he, he goes after these kings that have swallowed up the whole country now. He chases them down with this piddly little army of 318 people. He pursues them to Dan, Dan's way up in the north from where he's at in Mamre. So we're, we're talking about like 80 miles. He pursued them. See, how did he pursue them? Well, it's, it's stated in Scripture. I gave you the text in this lesson somewhere that he, that he had camels. So they probably pursued him with camels. Pursued him way up there to Dan. Remember now, he's pursuing four kings and their armies, Tedorlaomer, Tidal, Amraphel, and Arioch, and doing so with 318 beside himself. And what did he do? He smote them. <laughs> he, he defeated them. Now being in the, he, was, uh, he was in the vicinity of 80 years of age. We can't, don't forget this either. <laughs> he wasn't like a young man. He smote them. Boy, I love to read it. Kind of gives you boldness. And he did it strategically. He said, we're just not all 318 going to rush into their camp. Oh, we're going to split everybody up and come in from different angles so they'll think that we got more than we got. 
he divided them against uh, his servants. He used a strategic attack, and he attacked by night, not on the full day. What about an ultimate disadvantage? Now, this is a man I've been living with God for several years now. And so he, he's not been known for being a warrior or a king or a conqueror. It's not, he's just been a herd, herdsman and a farmer. But he's, uh, you, it's amazing what you can do when it needs to be done. So he, he smites him at Dan, but that's not all. He goes another 43 miles to Hobah, and he pursues them up there and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. Where? <laughs> that's a long, that's 123 miles from Mamre down here. Now let's say a word about the uh, virtue of being determined. This is a day of spiritual vacillation. That's how I view it. Determination is like stick to itiveness. You, you pursue. And this army is on the move. Or they were on the move. They devastated everything as they went. They just plowed everything under, so to speak. He's pursuing them. So they're on the move determined uh, to catch him. Determination. I am determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. See, that was, he kept on, Paul, just determination keeps you yeah. moving forward. I can tell you, even when you're sick, you can move, mm -hmm. keep moving. You got to keep moving. Mm -hmm. Kept pursuing him. I think some enemies do need to be pursued. This kind of posture requires you to cast off sin. You got to see that's a pursuing activity. Cast off sin, run the race, and set before. That's a pursuing activity. Well, to make a long story short, Abram defeats all these kings with these three hundred and eighteen men, and he brought back all the goods. Brought back again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. <laughs> they had to bring these goods back. Just Lot's flocks alone. See, they saw, he had to bring them back. He had to bring all these flocks, herds, goods, silver, gold, whatever they took. He had to bring it back. Someone said, well, that could, that might overload the camels, you know. Some of the soldiers may have to herd goats and sheep. Mm -hmm. He had to bring all this stuff back. Yeah. 123 miles back. Oh, no further than that. He had to take it down to Sodom. That's 200 miles away. Yeah. He had to bring all that stuff back. It's best if you can avoid losing things. It's best to avoid it. Because mm -hmm. it's not always that easy to recapture it and bring it back. Right. Am I not right? Yeah. <laughs> he brought it back. All the goods, all the goods. I can only imagine what kind of management that took to bring to bring all that back. All those flocks and herds. See, these four kings have been moving. They've been moving northward with all these things. See, the enemy had been moving with them. When they caught up with and defeated the enemy, they had to take them from the enemy and bring them back. In a way, sometimes. I think I can tell this to you with, with you not misunderstanding me. I see a lot of things that have been taken from God's people. And I'm determined in my own measure to bring them back. But it's not an easy chore to bring them back. Bring all this stuff back. But it had to be brought back. He brought back a lot in his goods. He didn't say, well, forget it a lot. You just had to you have to start over. Now, you've got to re recuperate. If you lose Jesus in Jerusalem, you've got to go back. Pick him up and take him back home. <laughs> so he brought back all the goods. Then he says, and the women also and the people. Oh, so it wasn't just Lot. 
in his goods. It's a lot of women were taken. And all he means is the people. How many people? <laughs> but he had to bring them back. So he got Lot and all his goods, got a lot of women, maybe the women whose husbands were slaughtered. He had to bring all that back. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the, from the slaughter <laughs> of Cheddar Labor. The slaughter. Some versions, they, they tone that down. The slaughter, they say, from the victory, from the, from the victory, or they, or from the defeat of, I like the slaughter. The word actually, they weren't gentle about it. They were aggressive. They, remember, this is Abram and 318 servants slaughtered the kings that had slaughtered nations. Remember all those nations he did? It's just the Amalekites and the Amorites, just there was a two of just two of them. Great nations, tremendous large territories. They'd and these three hundred and eight these of them slaughtered them. The slaughter of them. And the king came out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale. Someone said, wait a minute, doesn't it say back there that the king of Sodom fell in the slime pits? Well, in this, some people say, well, he recovered and came back. <laughs> this uh, must have been a replacement, a new king. Now we're at the point of the book where Genesis, the thrust of the book has changed. Prior to this, the bulk of the information pertained to the judgment of sinners. All right? Prior to chapter 12, the majority of what you read was about the judgment of sinners. Adam and Eve, Cain, during the flood, Tower of Babel. It's up to 11. It's all about the judgment of sinners. That's not what the bulk of the revelation is going to be about from this point on. It's going to be establishing the covenant with Abram. I made my covenant with Abram. He's never fought a battle in his life. Mm -hmm. And this is the only battle we know of that he did fight. This is the only exploit recorded of Abram. Yeah, that's if you were to say, what are the good things Abram did, this is it. <laughs> But just to show you, if all you have to fight is one great epoch battle, and maybe you've fought yours already, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. If that's all you got to fight is one great big epoch battle, and you've never done anything like this before, and you trust in God, and you walk through the land, you know what you got, you'll be able to overcome that incident called the evil day. Mm -hmm. You'll overcome the evil day. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think I'll close there. But in that some section of Scripture, just kind of thrills your soul. All the mirrors and pictures that are in there. <coughs> Compare in your, just as you're in your mind. Sometimes you can walk through Scripture with your mind. Just kind of walk through what you know about it. And think about what you know about Adam, Cain, Abel, Lamech, Seth, Enoch, Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and pitch Nimrod in and compare everything you know about them with what you know about Abraham. <laughs> we, just got, we just got started and it's already dwarfed all that you do about all those other people. <clears throat> What's that teach you? When you're known of God, well, you're a different sort of a person. You're just a different sort of a person. Any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? <coughs> Later, you're going to read about a man named Gideon that went yeah. over 300 men yeah. and did a very similar thing. But this, um, 
it, it's interesting that uh, all the whole time Lot's being carried north, he doesn't know that Abraham's that's coming. Right. He has right. no idea. That's right. And yet, yet the Lord's gonna gonna deliver him, and he's gonna use his 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 uncle to do that. Yeah, chase him down. He chased yeah. him down. Pursued him. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to just read over that. It's a, it was a marvelous account, Sister Tasha. Yeah, a couple of things. God doesn't, God doesn't always work in the manner men do, mm -hmm. as far as numbers are concerned, because it would it would detract from His glory. Mm -hmm. Like like with Gideon, it, it would have it would have taken the glory away from God. That's right. They would have been able to say, well, yeah, you you may have won, but it was because of all the men that you had. That's fighting. right. That's right. But when it was just three hundred <laughs> men, or in this case with Abram, Abraham, just just the few that he had, mm -hmm. it, it could yeah. be credited to God um, yeah. that he was the deliverer. Also, um, I like this verse fourteen too. We've been reading through the book of Genesis for school and. Um, when it said that when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants. Yeah, amen. And I, my mind immediately went to our Lord. When he heard that his brethren were taken, he armed his trained servants yeah. and he came and humbled himself mm -hmm. and, and took them back. Yeah, that's he right. Spoiled, he spoiled the enemy <laughs> and uh, brought, he's brought back. everything back. Yeah. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes, Judah. Now, as you were talking about when Abraham brought all of his trained servants, I thought that when we're in the kingdom and fighting the battle, we can't be ignorant of the things that God has given us. Mm -hmm. We do desire the sincere milk of the word, but when we, we mature and get stronger, yeah. we get meat of the word mm -hmm. and because we can process it. And when we're in the battle... We can't be sluggish. And mm -hmm. God has given us the resources that we need to be in f fight with precision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know when the scripture says cast off the sin and weight, and that's so you, you suppose sometimes you have to pursue that? Anyone else tonight? Yes. God's saving with few. Yeah. I love all these battles in scripture where God overcomes great large armies yeah. with just a few just people a few. because yeah. 2,000 years ago all the powers of darkness converged on Jerusalem and one man That's put right. all those powers to fight with <coughs> one act of obedience. That's right. Mm -hmm. Spoiled them. That's right. Mm -hmm. Made a display of them. Mm -hmm. Mr. Barb. The timing and the ordering of all of these things that happened isn't coincidence either because we see that first of all the Lord showed Abram all of the land. He brought him down into the plains to become familiar with the details and aspects, yeah. different aspects of the land, and only after those was he then called into the battle. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Brother Gene. It's a count that God is able to equip you yeah. and enable you to do, yeah. mm -hmm. you, even if you're not trained for it, yeah. specifically trained. If you have no experience, it doesn't matter. If he's directing you to do it, he'll give you what you need to do it. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes, but doing I used to think, I had the thinking that uh, that God got involved in Abraham's situation there with Lot because yeah. Abraham was a righteous man and everything, yeah. but it's actually the opposite. That's right. Actually, it's God is using Abraham but to, to bring about what he is doing. He, and Abraham can be right. used because he's a righteous man. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, this, this was a first thought to me about <laughs> neutralizing the power of these nations. 500 years in advance right. so they didn't they hadn't really got firmly seated and multiplied in the land or anyway because yeah. he has a purpose he's just not in and out but he's consistently working amen just a little bit yeah with with what everybody's saying about God doing so much with few um, what would it have mattered if the nations were weakened or if they were strong, I mean, if if this other king come in, like you said, come in and weaken the nations for Israel to, to take them, but would it even have mattered because God was before them? Yeah. So whether they were strong or whether they were weakened, God before them would have taken the nations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that, but that's how he works, see? Mm -hmm. He told them when he came, he said, I'm not going to give you all the land mm -hmm. at once. Because you're too few, you're not be able to drive them out. So there's this factor involved also. So 
He said, so I'm going to, and then wild beasts would come in and occupy the land and be a problem. So I'm going to give you a little by little by little. So he he does do it, but he does it through, he conquers through the people by making them equal to the case. And if they're not, like Israel, when they went into the land, they didn't drive them all out. Even in Joshua upbraided them, so you should drive them all out. But see, they they couldn't do it. And if they had been even bigger, you know, what well, it would have been worse. Yeah. You think we're doing it back here, just in the and the insight that we've gotten. Yeah. And I've just since I've been here, I've seen we got some things, and then as we've expanded uh, our our knowledge, then yeah. we've gotten more. So we've been able to get yeah. more from the Lord. Uh -huh. Concerning what Levine said there, whatever God gives you to do, then that is very true. Whether God is able to say with many or with few. But that whole thing is managed by God. That's that's the point. That it, and so if you've been given to do it, you are up to the you're up to doing what God tells you to do because of this that you said. That God is the one that is behind it. Yeah. Concerning that circumstance you're just talking about, the weakening of the nations, think about this within the context of the fact, the promise we're given that God will not allow you to be tempted above yeah. that which you're able, but He'll, he'll with every yeah. temptation, uh, give you a way of escape. You know, if you really are able to see it, God's not going to allow you to uh, uh, um, have an amount of opposition yeah. that if you don't uh, act in, in, in the right way, according to it, that it'll actually be beneficial to you. Yeah. That this, this this he's actually God designed did. these oppositions to to work out the thing in you that he has designed to work out in you. And I also appreciate what you said about walking about the land. Mm -hmm. I, I thought this is perfectly demonstrated in the account of uh, er, earlier. Whenever we first come into Christ, whenever uh, um, we, we begin our walk, we come out kind of like Abraham came out, you know, not really knowing a whole lot about the destination yeah. and and um, acting on obedience and faith. But there comes a point where you have to know the details, where you have to be able yeah. to walk about the land and to be able to see it. Uh, it reminds me of something that Brother Al said at the renewal, I think it was two years ago. He said, you can't survive on thumbnail views of Jesus. Yeah. You know? It's the, the 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 opposition in this world is too great. You have to be able to have a a, a good view of the land. So Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On this this matter of uh, weakening the enemy, this is what Jesus did when he destroyed the devil and spoiled principalities and powers. Now you've got to resist the devil, and you have to wrestle against principalities and powers. But if God hadn't diminished their strength. What you it couldn't be done. So he first weakens the foe, then he calls you into the situation. <laughs> it's still absolutely impossible yeah. in the flesh to do. Yeah. Amen. So you still have to have his strength working in you. Yeah. It has to be him working in you. But but even even in in that in the context of that, it, what only Jesus was able to conquer him right. one on one like he did. You take when he goes down to like Goliath. Goliath had a weakness, but no nobody else saw it. But it was his forehead. That's right. His forehead was showing. <laughs> That's right. And David saw it. Huh? Yeah. Nobody else saw it. They don't look at. Hey, look. So there, no matter what you're facing, there's a the disadvantage is ultimately on the enemy's side. It is. It's on the enemy's side. But you've got to see it. All right. Have all of you met Brother Kerm? Brother Kerm, stand up and introduce yourself. I'm Bashir from Pakistan, and I came uh, in U.S. just three months ago, and I'm getting my studies in Biblical Studies in Cathedral Bible College in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And it's a great privilege to be here, to listen to the Word of God, to meet the such wonderful people. I'm very glad to meet you all. Amen. Amen. I tell him you would, he was familiar with us from writings in Pakistan. Yeah. And where Brother Given and Brother Hitchcraft went, 
I I was I am living very next to the street where they preached. Yeah. <laughs> In Pakistan, where they stayed, they they stayed very next to my street, and they preached there, and I was there <laughs> that time. Amen. Yeah. All right. We'll have a word of prayer.